The royal family and horses is a centuries old partnership. From the Queen's 60 year obsession with breeding racehorses. If she's got a horse that's first past the post, then she's really leaping for joy. In terms of making money from the sport as an owner, that's a figure bandied around about eight million. To the family's devotion to polo that crosses four generations. That love of horses in the royal family goes all the way down from the Queen down to her grandchildren. You forgot your boots. Oh my God. <laughs> So where did the Queen's love of horses begin? Uh, some wags have even suggested that when she was born, she was sitting on a rocking horse. What are the secrets of the royal racehorses? If I've had the privilege to ride for Her Majesty, it's hard to explain the level of pride you get when you first wear those colours. And it's going to be a royal victory, I think. What are the royal family's most infamous equine dramas? Go, 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 go. She was unconscious when I got there. And will horses continue to hold a special place in the hearts of the royals? Particularly William, he will do his ceremonial duties on horseback, just as his grandmother has done. The Queen is admired around the world for her expertise in horses. She owns them, studies them, breeds them and races them. Horse racing is the love of her life. Um, no, I shouldn't say that, should I? Prince Philip's the love of her life. For her, this is a really scientific and technical operation. It's a big sort of endeavor to produce a race winning horse in terms of uh, the genetics that go into that horse and also the training. She goes, when possible, to horse racing. And if she can't go, she watches it and she studies form. The Queen's most successful year as a racehorse owner came in her Silver Jubilee year of 1977. The year of punk, Ford Fiestas and new micro TVs was also the year she celebrated 25 years on the throne. I want to thank all those who have sent me messages of congratulations on my Silver Jubilee. Year for the Queen. Obviously, she was busy and very much in demand. And to the man and woman in the street, that was a, a year of such great excitement. The Queen was taken to a fruit stall, fruit was offered, and finally, one shiny apple was accepted. The Queen received another gift in 1977 the racing triumph of one of her beloved horses, Dunfermline. Dunfermline is a special horse for many reasons. Um, she was a filly bred by the Queen, and she was a filly who really read the script. And they're racing. She was a filly that came out into her best, you know, over long trips, mile and a half, mile and three quarters. You know, stamina was her forte. Dunfermline was a, a gift to the nation, really. Like many of the Queen's horses before her, Dunfermline was bred to compete in the British Classics, a historic series of flat races. The five races take place between April and September. Two are for fillies, two are for colts, and the final race, the St. Ledger, is for both. You can only run in either the 2,000 or 1,000 guineas, either the Derby or the Oaks, and the St. Ledger. So you've actually got three opportunities. On the 4th of June, 1977, the Oaks took place at Epsom, and all eyes were on Dunfermline. The Queen's jockey for the big day was Willie Carson. Willie Carson was a real breath of fresh air, and he, he was a bubbly personality in the saddle. He was a real pushing jockey, and uh, he wanted to win. It was a very, very big day. Dunfermline would be well fancied. She was six to one, but she wasn't the favorite. The Oaks took place three days before the Queen's Silver Jubilee celebrations. As the race got underway, Carson found himself poorly placed. He had to hustle in the race because Dunfermline wasn't the quickest sort of in a stride. Probably not very suited to Epsom either because it's a very undulating track. She managed to hold on by three quarters of a length, which sounds like a small margin, but at the end of a race like that, it's fairly comfortable. And it's Dunfermline on the near side having a right battle with Prisa Tinker. It took a fair time to wear down the 
others, but she she did in the end. On the near side, Willie Carson, Dunfermline. And it's going to be a royal victory, I think, on the near side, Dunfermline. And Dunfermline now going into the lead. And Dunfermline wins the oak from Breeze the Secret, Bakley Deb. The sad thing was that because of the Silver Jubilee celebrations, it was on a Saturday, and there was a big event at Windsor, so the Queen couldn't actually be there. But a much-loved figure was there in the Queen's place. The Queen Mother. When Dunfermline won, there would have been such exhilaration. And this would have felt wonderful. I think everyone's very proud to have a winner for the Queen, be it the jockey, the lad who looks after the horse, the trainer, and, you know, and everyone who's involved, really, in the stables, because people are keen to do well for her, and, uh, and I think are, are pleased for her that, you know, they've managed to get it right and have a winner. When Dunfermline went on to win the St Ledger three months later at Doncaster, she made history for the Queen. To win two classes in one year is unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's terrific. It, it, it was one of the highest points if not the highest point, of the whole of the Queen's racing interest. Royal horses like Dunfermline are always ridden by jockeys who wear the Queen's colours. These silk tunics have a very rich history. It's red and it's purple, and that is going back to George V and his colours. But most importantly, purple in particular is always the colour of a royal we have to remember that in the Tudor period, people were forbidden from wearing purple if they weren't royal. So I love the fact that the Queen, when her jockeys are on horseback, uses the most ostentatious royal colours. They really make a big statement and say, I am the Queen's horse and I am the Queen's jockey. I've had the privilege to ride for Her Majesty on numerous occasions, which has been a great privilege for me. And in that time, I've had a few winners. It's hard to explain the level of, of pride you get when you first wear those colours. These are special to the Queen. You can't really get much bigger than that. You really look the part. You can probably feel like you're part of royalty when you're wearing them. More than 1,600 horses owned by the Queen have won races over the last 70 years. Her victory record dates back to 1953, just two weeks after her coronation ceremony. Her Majesty herself was evidently in gay mood as she had a word with her jockey, Doug Smith, who was riding Choir Boy, a colt who disappointed at Royal Ascot last year. Choir Boy started well, kept up with the pack, and as the pack moved down the straight, he just ran on. Judging his time nicely, Smith brought Choir Boy along in a strong and successful challenge to beat Brunetta. So this time it was victory for the Queen. It marked the start of her Royal Ascot when she's now got 23 and still counting. Her Majesty, who must certainly have been delighted by her success, went with members of her family to see Choir Boy. Royal Ascot is the most prestigious event in the racing calendar, and one of the oldest. It's held every June, with 30 races over five days, and prizes with a combined total of more than £6 million. I would say Royal Ascot is the pinnacle of flat racing. Everybody wants to be there. It's an intoxicating mix of the very, very best horses taking each other on, all wedded together beautifully with tradition, history. There's something really magical about the Queen arriving at Royal Ascot in her carriage from her castle, and it's sort of in her back garden. It's like we've all been invited to this amazing party. Royal Ascot is always a must for the Queen. She wouldn't miss it for the world. It's where she wants to be every year. Of course, Ascot is all about glamour and hats. Did you get it off the peg or did you have it specially made for you? I had it specially made for Royal Ascot. And there's always a little bit of extra glamour with the Queen because she is at the very heart of Royal Ascot, so it needs to be seen. In 2013, all eyes were on her new horse, a filly called Estimate, who ran in the Gold Cup on Ladies' Day. She had that lovely combination of class and stamina, and um, that obviously gave her an outstanding chance. The buzz before the Gold Cup that year was fantastic, largely because everybody knew Estimate was there with a really good chance. Could the Queen possibly win the Ascot Gold Cup? Winning this prize would be a massive coup for the Queen, as none of her royal predecessors had achieved it in the history of the Gold Cup. The Queen was wearing her game face. 
The Queen doesn't do nerves. The Queen doesn't really do apprehension. And she's very pragmatic. If she's got a horse running, she's kind of smiling. And if the horse is near the front, she's smiling even more. And if it's first past the post, then she's really leaping for joy. In fact, estimates romped to victory. It's the first time a reigning monarch had won, and that was in 207 years of the race. So it was extremely exciting. She was clearly so overjoyed. That smile, I'll never, ever forget that smile. If she were to tell me it was the happiest day of her life, you would believe her. The victorious estimate is now 10 years old, living in happy retirement at Sandringham. And the Queen has never forgotten her achievement. The Queen wanted to commemorate this very special event. So now, an enormous sculpture of Estimate is right at the front entrance of Sandringham. So it is the first thing everyone sees when they go to visit the Queen. I think that tells you what that race meant to her and what that horse means to her. In spite of these successes, the Queen has one unfulfilled racing ambition victory for one of her horses at an event where success has eluded her. Oh, tantalizingly, the Derby is the one gap on the Queen's CV. She's won all the other British classics and she's come so close. The Queen has never won the Epsom Derby and there is no doubt that she would dearly love to add that string to her bow. She's made no secret of the fact that she would dearly love to win the Epsom Derby. The closest the Queen came to a Derby victory was in 1953 with her horse, Oreo. Oreo seemed to be in a state of great excitement, but then, who wasn't? I mean, he wasn't favourite, but he was sort of third or fourth favourite, and he finished second. But the finish was all Pinson, who went on to pass the post four lengths ahead of the Queen's Oreo and alone in the picture. Nancy was obviously most excited, even if victory had eluded her. Oriol would have been one of the, the Queen's best colts, probably one of the best colts she's ever had. And then he actually went on to become a champion sire in the 60s as well, so he had great longevity as a, a flag bearer for the Queen. For the time being, the Queen is still racing and breeding her thoroughbreds. She has 38 horses racing this year. The only person who knows how many horses the Queen has um, is the Queen, her racing manager and her trainer. Nobody else knows. The leader is Rosa. Still pressing, though, is colouring in second place. Her Majesty's got two real standout horses at the moment. She's got a horse called Sextant, who could be a really interesting stayer of the future. And Estimate, the Gold Cup winner, is a mum herself now. And this year, one of her sons, a horse called Calculation, has won three races. And there's some of her horses that, you know, might only win once. I'm thinking of a horse called Equal Sum. She's still in training. I'm riding Equal Sum for Her Majesty in um, a Phillies handicap. And she's done ever so well. I had the privilege of riding her last year in Wolverhampton, which she won. And hopefully today she can take another step forward. So the Queen's run Equal Sum on the rail. The Queen is said to have made around £8 million pounds in prize money from horse races since the 1980s. There are various figures bandied around about how much she's earned from racing, but to breed a horse, to get a horse to the track, train it every week, deal with its injuries, the vet, the farrier. There's a saying in racing that if you want to make a, a small fortune, start with a big one. When the official result of the 2.45 was announced, the Queen couldn't contain her delight. Those who know the Queen say that money isn't everything. It's all about a passion that she's enjoyed for nine decades. You have the three really different types of horse. You have the race horses, you have the horse that will take the Queen on the ride, and then you have the household cavalry. But in 1981, the Queen's mastery of her horses was put to the ultimate test, and her life placed in danger by a gunman during Trooping the Colour. A man came out and fired some blanks at the pair, and the horse obviously spooked. The Queen's lifelong fascination with horses 
has given her an unprecedented knowledge of all things equestrian. For the Queen, horses and particularly horse racing, her number one, number one interest outside country, commonwealth and family. She has the ability of seeing if a horse is lame from a good hundred meters away. That is how knowledgeable she is about horses. If you talk to any trainers or other owners, they will say the Queen is as knowledgeable as any racehorse owner out there. She would look them in the eye the way that people do look at, you know, their dogs, their horses, and see what you feel about them, how you think they are in themselves, and try to come to some sort of an opinion. It isn't just about intuition. The Queen relies on the latest technology to stay fully acquainted with the lives of her horses. A system was put into place at Sandringham Stud whereby cameras were put up in the folding berths and the Queen asked her stud manager, David Summers, if he would give her a call and let her know when a mare was going into foal. And uh, he said, you know, Your Majesty, is that during the night as well? And she said, yes. And so now, whenever a mare goes into foal, any time of the day or night, the Queen is alerted and she can now watch it on her iPad. The Queen's interest in thoroughbreds is just part of a story of monarchs and their horses, which dates back nearly a thousand years. The king or queen in the Tudor period and the medieval period is still seen as someone who will lead the troops into battle, and that must be done on a horseback. Once essential in wartime, horses were soon found to be ideal for our monarch's leisure pursuits. The big royal for horses, well, that's Henry VIII. He loved jousting, he loved riding. Queen Elizabeth I was watching some horse racing of kind. Both King James I and King Charles II built palaces at Newmarket to hunt and race horses on the local heath. Later royals followed their lead. I mean, Queen Anne started Ascot Racecourse, for instance, and the Prince Regent became a huge owner. During the 19th century, Queen Victoria enjoyed riding for exercise. But it was not until 1910 that the royal family renewed their love of all things equestrian. George V absolutely adored horses. That love was inherited by his son, George VI, and particularly by his granddaughter, Elizabeth II. The Queen is the most enthusiastic member of the royal family when it comes to horses that, you know, in living history. I think really they're part of her DNA. Any time she ran horses, actually, it's when I think we see her um, probably at her most natural. There's some wags have even suggested that when she was born, she was sitting on a rocking horse. That's how much horses mean to her. Princess Elizabeth was four years old when her passion for horses first blossomed. Her father, King George VI, bought her Shetland pony called Peggy, and she was plonked on Peggy's back and mum or dad held her hand. And it's a bit like duck taking to water. By the time she got into her early teens, she'd be out riding by herself. The Queen's childhood was one of those aristocratic ones which in the 1930s would automatically have horses everywhere. In the early 1940s, the King took her to visit his racehorses, Big Game and Sun Chariot. It's reported that stroking them was such a happy moment for her she didn't wash her hands for several hours afterwards. Horses were a part of her life, much the same way as youngsters going to school. They're either kicking a football or hitting a ball with a hockey stick or with a tennis racket. Um, that was her sport. Princess Elizabeth is 18 years old on the 21st of April, and the date is a milestone in our constitution, for she will then assume the dignities and responsibilities of heir presumptive to the throne. One of the Queen's many official roles is as Colonel-in-Chief of her official bodyguard, the Household Cavalry. Visiting their stables and spending time with their horses is a real treat for her. The Queen was presented with the horse that she'd gifted them, who had been in special training. The horse formerly known as Joni, Majesty. So you're going to this came from the Royal Stud at the Court. And the Queen made some comments about what she looked like, how she was coming on, and gave Joni a polo. 
It was very, very sweet. She was very animated. It was one of the only times I've seen her take off her glove. Well, this is properly black, isn't it? <laughs> she was given a horse from the Canadian mounted police called Burmese, and this has become known sort of as her favorite horse, and it wasn't even a racehorse. The Queen owned Burmese for more than 20 years, and the public got to see her during the Queen's annual birthday parade, trooping the color. The Queen rode it every year for 18 consecutive seasons, which is a considerable amount of time for a horse to serve. In fact, she loved Burmese so much that there's a statue of her in Canada, which she's unveiled, but also for her 90th birthday celebrations, she had a replica rocking horse of Burmese made for her. When Burmese retired, the Queen decided not to replace her. Since 1987, she has used a carriage to ride to Trooping the Colour and inspect the troops. The ceremony of 1,400 servicemen and 200 horses is a grand display of military precision. Chipping the colour goes back to when it was the monarch's job to review the troops. And that has really been the monarch's job for as long as there has been a monarchy. It's a duty she will not want to forego. Despite the security surrounding the event, the Queen's safety was put in danger in 1981 when a teenage gunman shot at her six times. A man came out and fired some blanks at the pair. Scotland Yard spokesman said that 17-year-old Marcus Simon Sargent had been charged with willfully discharging a cartridge pistol in the vicinity of Her Majesty the Queen, intent on alarming her. The horse obviously spooked, and then she gently calms the horse, settles it down, which I think shows her great skill as a horsewoman in that sort of atmosphere with everyone's eyes on her as well. Although the Queen no longer rides in public, she still does so at Windsor, Sandringham and Balmoral whenever she can. Still doesn't wear a hard hat, still wears a scarf, uh, has never worn a hard hat all her life, and at 93 she's not about to start. The Queen may have avoided injury in her nine decades on horseback, but later generations of sporting royals have not been so lucky. When Prince Charles was thrown from his horse... It was a major fall, major break. The media were whipped into a frenzy. The buzz was going around that he'd be disabled, he'd never be able to play polo again, he wouldn't be able to salute or anything like that. The Queen's love of horse racing is huge, but it's not the only equestrian sport that holds a special place in the hearts of the Windsors. I think polo is rather a royal tradition. It is known as the sport of kings. It's opulent. It's a very intricate sport in that you've got to have good polo ponies. You might be galloping down chasing a ball that's going in the wrong direction and you want it to go back to the opponent's goal and you've really got to whack the ball and turn your pony around on the sixpence to chase after the ball again. Prince Harry is there as well. Great play by Prince Harry gets the ball away and gets out of danger. It's a wonderful sport. It's a lovely sociable day out, you bring your family, you picnic, you have a glass of champagne and strawberries. It's all the best of a British summer. Polo originated in what was known as Persia. It was first played in Britain in 1869, but its popularity exploded during the 1950s, and that's largely down to Prince Philip. The Duke was already a skilled cricket and hockey player, but polo soon became his true passion. He spearheaded the sport after falling in love with it while serving in Malta with the Royal Navy. His uncle was commander of the cruiser squadron in Malta, and it was actually his uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten, who introduced Prince Philip to polo, and he took to it. He loved it. 
When Prince Philip had to come back to England because he was now sort of full-time consort to the Queen, he was looking for something to do. He'd been a man who spent his entire life dedicated to being a naval man, to going to war, and then when there was peace, he did feel a bit at sea. Having played polo in Malta, he decided that, well, why don't we play polo in England? Prince Philip needed somewhere the size of about five football fields to play, and he found the perfect setting within the 4,800 acres of a royal park. He thought, use a section of Windsor Great Park. It was all this land and nothing was being done with it. So in January 1955, the Household Brigade Polo Club was opened. It was here Prince Philip captained his very own team. He formed the Windsor Park polo team and they went on to win loads of cups and really prestigious tournaments. Throughout the 50s and 60s, they accumulated a collection of the sport's most celebrated cups. He played a lot at Windsor and because of that, there is a very large polo community that has sprung up and that essentially is because of Prince Philip. It's put so much time and support into the sport. Each player is given a handicap rating for their skills and value to the team, ranging between minus two and the highest ten. Just nine players worldwide hold the highest rank. In 1971, the Duke had reached a respectable five and reluctantly retired from the sport he adored. Prince Philip ended up giving up polo when he was about 50, which is actually quite a ripe old age for polo because it's a very, very demanding sport physically. And he was getting arthritis. And I think one of his greatest disappointments was having to give it up because it was just too painful for him. Arthritis can be very painful. The Duke's polo career caught the eye of his son, Prince Charles, whose love of horses developed from the sidelines while he watched his father play. In 1980, he rode his own horse, his first racehorse, Ali Baba, and actually came second. And Prince Charles, he was really so attached to Ali Baba. Prince Charles is actually extremely horsey. He went on to become probably one of the top 10 British players at his peak. Charles's first polo pony was a gift from his father. And at the age of just 15, he made his debut on a team captained by Prince Philip. Charles continued to play throughout his teenage years. He needed something energetic to let off steam. You can be angry and you get on a horse and you start chasing a ball and you can whack it with a mallet and let off steam that way. In 1979, he played in a match which perhaps remains one of his greatest sporting memories. He scored all four of the Royal Navy's goals and received the Rundle Cup from his great uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten. This poignant picture documents one of the final moments Charles would spend with his beloved uncle. Just weeks later, he was killed by an IRA bomb. Prince Charles was once quoted as calling polo his one great extravagance, but it's a high-risk sport. Traditional wooden balls are hit at speeds of up to 96 miles per hour. And falls at high speed mean injuries are common. Charles knows this only too well. When it happened, did he fall or was he pushed? Charles, just exiting quietly. If you are galloping a pony at 40 miles an hour, and turning on a sixpence and screeching to a halt and screeching around the bend, you are going to fall off and you are going to get kicked and you are going to break things. It's just the nature of the sport. They say that it takes seven falls to make a rider and most riders fall off a lot more than that in their career. Charles's love of polo has come at a cost. Dickie Arbiter has first-hand experience of the Prince's accidents. He did his back in. Uh, so he did suffer from back problems, and I remember I'd been at polo matches with him, and on occasions, in the break, the end of a chucker, he would actually sort of just lie flat on the ground just to ease the pain in his back, but he'd always get back on to finish the game. Every injury sustained by the heir to the throne was scrutinised by the press. Yeah, there was one occasion in Florida. He got whacked by the end of a mallet, and he's got a scar. Also in Florida, he was very dehydrated, came off. 
The worst injury he had was 1990. He went off to play polo at Sirencester. And the next thing, I had a phone call to say he'd come off his pony. He's broken his arm. And then I dashed down to the Sirencester Cottage Hospital. And yes, he had broken his arm in three places. Prince Charles is still in some pain, but he's out of bed sitting in a chair in his pyjamas. It was a major fall, major break, uh, and uh, the arm very swollen. The buzz was going around that he'd be disabled, he'd never be able to play polo again, he wouldn't be able to salute or anything like that. And I got it verbally from the, uh, from the surgeon that the bone should knit and he will be able to play polo again and he will be able to salute. His polo career was catapulted into the spotlight once again in 1981. Prince Charles was picked to play for his country in a match three days before his wedding. And if you're picked to play for your country, you don't turn that down because it's an honor. I don't think that it was perhaps the most brilliant idea to play just before his wedding. But for Charles, I think the wedding was a very stressful moment and playing was a way of alleviating that stress. Throughout his life, polo has been a great escape for Prince Charles. And it has been an escape, I think, for what's been difficulties in his emotional life, difficulties with his parents, difficulties in his marriage. Polo was one of the few places where he felt he could be ordinary and where he felt he could be free. In 2015, three days after his 67th birthday, Clarence House released a statement announcing Charles' retirement from polo. A spokesman told the press he decided to bow out gracefully, but regretfully. It was a wise decision to actually give up. And there are some who say he should have given up earlier, but your body tells you when it's time. You don't necessarily listen to what other people say. He then had a series of injuries and I think thought it might be best to retire before he broke every bone in his body. It comes as no surprise that Charles' sons grew up so captivated by horses and ponies. They had Shetland ponies called Smokey and Trigger, and Harry was put on when he was really very small. He got put on the horse and he cried when he got taken off. Harry really loved horses, and I really think they appeal to Harry's desire for freedom and speed, and sometimes to be a little bit reckless. Just like their father and grandfather, the princes started moving in polo circles from a young age. They would go to God's Polo Club or wherever their dad was playing, and they would grab hold of a spare mallet and play something akin to croquet. And eventually they took to riding horses. Prince William comes forward, can he get control? He's over on the far side. Can he go all the way? Prince William gets the big kid, he's for the opposition half. They're obviously both very talented at polo. I think Prince William is, is more exceptional for being a left-handed player and playing a right-handed sport because it's not for left-handers. Prince Harry in particular, he did think he wants to be a professional polo player. But Prince Charles said to him that princes can't really do that kind of thing. They have to do charity work and representation. So the princes came up with an inspired idea. Combine charity work with their favorite sport. William and Harry have taken the decision to play polo just for very special causes. So every year throughout the summer, they tend to play in a series of polo matches that are specifically in aid of charities they support. In 2018, Prince Harry participated in the Centre Bale Polo Cup. The event raised over £1 million for children affected by HIV in Africa. Prince Harry and Prince William have, have raised over £10 million for charity through their polo tournaments. Polo events are an open arena where the public get a rare glimpse into the playful nature of the royals. Harry is polishing his boots. William has forgotten well, his. You're an idiot. Boots on my car. Get this on camera. Ah, you forgot your boots. <laughs> oh my god. That's another classic. Use yeah, borrow my ones. Oh, no. Should fit. That's just about the super thing, okay then. Polo has long been the setting for family gatherings. It's not unusual for the family to go and watch husbands playing polo. Through the decades, many affectionate and carefree moments have been caught on camera. Polo is always a thrilling game to watch. Obviously, the royal party found it so on this occasion. Late Diana, Princess of Wales, 
went regularly to watch Prince of Wales. And I'm really pleased to be able to bring my wife on this occasion so that she can loyally watch her husband make a fool of himself. <laughs> Duchess of Cambridge is keen on polo and she feels that it's good for the children to run around and have a bit of fresh air. And Duchess of Sussex will go along and, and watch Harry because she's in love with her husband and she wants to watch her husband playing polo. What better reason? I heard Barack Obama had, has given Prince George a polo manner, so he obviously knows the significance of polo for the family. Whatever their age, the royals are lovers of all equine sports. They drive around obstacles at high speeds, screeching around the turns. However, even away from the polo fields, their sporting pursuits are filled with drama. It got smashed up regularly. I didn't actually see what, what happened. The, the horse hit the fence. She, she was unconscious when I got there. The Queen and her family's love of horses spans a lifetime. Horses are just in the DNA of the royal family. After retiring from polo in 1971, Prince Philip kept his long-standing passion for horses alive by taking up the oldest equestrian style of racing, competitive carriage driving. Prince Philip, who was second last weekend at the Hoston Horse Driving Trials in Scotland, winner first time out this season at the Brighton Horse Driving Trials. <laughs> What precisely are the judges looking for? In a sense, the accuracy of the driving, which it sounds relatively easy, but in fact, when you try and do it, it drives you up the wall. Really, before Prince Philip, carriage driving was seen as something, as a historical anachronism, an oddity. And then Prince Philip really transformed it into a sport. Competitions are normally held over three days and riders are judged on dressage, speed over a 10-kilometer course, and cone driving. It doesn't come cheap. The full kit can cost around 35,000 pounds. Prince Philip got his from the Royal Mews. I thought to myself, well, we've got horses and carriages and grooms. I said, well, why don't I have a go? So I borrowed four horses and practiced, and, and you know, thought, well, why not? <laughs> The things that did find difficult were the horses. Horses were used to walking the streets of London, not treading the paths of Windsor Great Park or going through water. But Prince Philip coaxed them, usually with sugar lumps. But he developed a passion for carriage driving, so much so that he got together with a group from the FEI, the International Equestrian Federation, to write the rule book, Carriage Driving. The Duke was the driving force behind the development of the sport. Despite its often hazardous nature, popularity started to soar. This isn't horse and cart stuff. They drive around obstacles at high speeds, screeching around the turns. It's very, very active. It's very competitive and fast-paced. Carriages can cost several thousand pounds, but he opted for one already in the royal stables the Belmoral dog cart. But the constant battering on rough terrain to this antique structure meant it had to be rebuilt yearly. It got smashed up regularly. I don't think that would have um, unnerved him on Julie. He played polo after all, which is a much higher risk sport. He flew aeroplanes. Um, I think he, he enjoyed the fast paced, exciting um, sports and that's probably what drew him to it in the first place. One, go. Despite the dangers, the Duke was hooked. He persevered after coming close to last in his first competition. Lo and behold, his second tournament was the European Championships. He went on to compete in two more European Championships and I think six World Championships and was really a very, very high-class competitor. Philip announced his retirement from the sport in 2017. But his devotion is still evident today as he drives fell ponies, a royal favorite, around Sandringham. Here he is, 98, and he's still carriage driving. He's going out reasonably regularly with a coach and four to um, a bit of exercise. Loves it. 
He won't give that up. Prince Philip's love for horses naturally rubbed off on his daughter Anne. He's famously quoted, describing his daughter's obsession, if it doesn't fart or eat hay, she isn't interested. Anne triumphed in the thrilling equestrian sport of eventing. Competitors are marked on dressage, show jumping, and cross country. Princess Anne, like Prince Charles, is extremely horsey. She would have achieved more notable success because she became European champion in eventing. Um, so she was a phenomenal rider in her era. Just like her brother, Anne's falls get almost as much attention as her achievements. In 1976, disaster struck at the Portman Hunt trials. I didn't actually see what, what happened, but it looked like so that the horse hit the fence and she got thrown onto the ground and the horse came over on top and rolled, rolled on top. She was unconscious when I got there. It was later learnt that Princess Anne had cracked a vertebra. Anne bounced back fast. Later that year, she took part in the Montreal Olympic Games on the Queen's horse, Goodwill. Her career has inspired a generation of new equestrian stars, including her daughter, Zara. Zara Tyndall, with her parents, had no option other than to be a phenomenal rider. Her father, Captain Mark Phillips, was one of the best riders of his generation, and he's also a renowned coach. Zara has spoken about the fact that she talks to the Queen about horses all the time, that there's a passion she shares with her grandmother. It was inevitable she would follow in the footsteps of her mother. After studying physiotherapy, she couldn't ignore her equestrian talents. In 2005, Zara competed at the European Eventing Championships at Blenheim with her trusty chestnut gelding, Toy Town. Martha Terry watched in awe. And she had to go out and ride the round of her life. And the rain was, was coming down in steroids. And goes in the lead. At just 24 years old, Zara was crowned individual European champion. And the following year, she became world champion. So she showed she's not just a, a one-hit wonder. In 2011, Toy Town retired from competitions and Zara teamed up with a new horse, High Kingdom, affectionately known as Trev. And in 2012, they competed in the biggest event of her life, the London Olympics. So the London Olympics would have meant a lot. It's on home ground. That was incredible to see homegrown talent but also a member of the royal family competing here, and the British public were very excited about that. Zara became the first Royal Olympic medalist, winning silver, a jubilant moment for her country and her family. Princess Anne, Princess Royal, presented it, and that would have been a proud moment, not just for Mum, but for Zara as well. She's absolutely a top rider in her own right, but she definitely has the genes for it. The Queen's love of horses began as a child, and through the years, her fascination has remained. Today, it's very clear the Queen's passion and her family's are as strong as ever. It's an important part of royal life and an important part of royal pleasure that you can ride your horses. They've kept alive centuries of historical links and love between royalty and this awe-inspiring animal. The horse plays a big role in the life of the royal family. And I believe it will continue to do so. Oh, how's that? And I think for William, it's very important to him that if he can, when he comes to the throne, he will do his ceremonial duties on horseback just as his grandmother has done.